Hi everyone and welcome to episode 327 of Aussie Tech Heads coming here to you on the Thursday the 7th of February 2013 and every Thursday night aussietechheads.com.au forward slash live and uh, you can sit with us and watch us live in the studio or in the lounge and um, I'm not sure how the audio is going to come out with this episode. It seems a bit soft, but hopefully uh, in, the, in the post we might be able to fix that up. Uh, all right, so light on tonight. We've only got uh, Shane with us. Hey, Shane, how you doing? Hey, good, Glenn. Good people. How are you all? Good, good, good. Now, uh, Eric is, uh, I don't know, got something on, and Will is picking people up from the airport. So good on you, Will, and um, hope you find your way home. Now, so this week, what's been happening this week? Um, lots of news, lots of news. I've got a few stories. Shane's got a few stories, and we're going to show share the ones that we found uh, somewhat interesting that's uh, happened in the tech news this week. Now, uh, Aussie Tech Heads, tech is uh, web hosting. Uh, hosting is um, at, where can you find the hosting? At aussietechheads.com.au forward slash hosting. Uh, it's fast, affordable, and professional web hosting. So, uh Get your teeth into some of that if you're looking for that. All right, uh, Shane, where do you want to start? I think we'll start at the top and we can either do your first Telstra story or you can do my story about... Do you want to do... We, we usually start with the, his, the history. Do you want to do that? All right, we'll do that. What do you, what do you, what's happened this week in, in years uh, gone by? Another light on week. Um, I'm trying to sort of filter out all the non-techie stuff. And um, there was something that happened during the week where some apparently famous guy was born, but I didn't know who he was, so he didn't get a mention. Oh, okay. Well, that <laughs> all right? Okay, there wasn't. They so, dug up a king. I know that, but that wasn't it. No, 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 no. That was King Richard. Ed, what do you know a bit about him? Uh, only that he had um, he had scoliosis, oh, okay. um, curvature of the spine. Apparently, yeah. yeah. Um, he's they. they Tested the, well, they kind of confirmed that it was him because of DNA from descendants. Oh yeah. And I kind of thought, if they found descendants, how come those descendants aren't royalty? They're just, you know, your average, you know, average people. Average Joe, yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> the royal family seem to be uh, go crazy <laughs> with all that sort of stuff. Um, all right. So we'll get back to your tech history. What what's been yep. going on? All right. So February 6, 1959, Titan launches. Cold War heats up. This is um, basically a, a story about the first Titan rocket that was launched uh, in 1959. Um, it's a what they call a intercontinental ballistic missile, or it kind of doubles as that. Apparently, it wasn't the first one of those intercontinental ballistic missiles to be launched. Um, the both America and I think Russia had launched a, a few in the early 50s, um, and yeah, so that's what's happened in in February 6. When you adjusted the volume then, Glenn, I had my voice back again, but it's gone, so that's right. Okay. We'll carry on. All right. <laughs> okay, keep going. <laughs> I'm just um, just fiddling with the volume here because uh, it's just looking like it's it's coming out okay now, but it was just a bit soft, so I didn't want it to go the whole episode. Um, all right, next one you've got here. Major assist removes enormous cyst. Major assist. What's that? Right, this is a story where doctors in Chicago complete the world's longest operation in history, a four-day marathon to remove an enormous 300-pound ovarian cyst from a 58-year-old patient, obviously wow. female patient. 300 pounds? That's like 150 kilos. Is that right? Yeah, give or take. Wow, big cyst. Oh, I wouldn't, wouldn't want that one to pop on you. And uh, yeah. what's that last one you've pulled out there? A uh, February the 1st, 1930. Yep. Actually, there's a couple more. February 1st, 1893. Lights, can I, can I, I know I was going to stuff this word up. Can I graph action? Basically, this is the um, story of the invention of the predecessor for the, the movie camera. It was Thomas Edison, and he showed a, uh, a movie called, well, I suppose it was a movie, for the want of a better word, called Black Mariah. It's actually pronounced, even though it looks like Maria. And, um, yeah, like I said, it was a, a, a thing called the kinetograph. I'm probably still stuffing the word up. And, yeah, it was a forerunner for the movie camera. Yeah, but a, 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 kinti, a kintograph, a kind, a kind of, yeah, who knows who, who knows what that is. And, um, all right, and you've got a, a satellite discovery, discovers the Van Allen belt. Yes, on January 31, 1958, the first US satellite that was launched discovers the Van Allen belt. The United States uh, enters the space age with the successful launch of the Explorer 1 satellite. 
data from the satellite confirms the existence of a radiation belt uh, girdling the Earth. Um, that's obviously called the the Van Halen belt. I don't really know much about the Van, belt. Van Halen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it was yeah based on the the, the band or whether it's a leather belt or what. I have no idea. Well, maybe just um, yeah, Alan. And yeah, that's all right. Good stuff. Now, um, yeah. So Van Allen belts and all that's uh, that's all that's all crazy. Get all that in um, Star Trek and you know Star Wars and Doctor Who and all that sort of stuff. Now we're getting into some tech stories. Let me uh, let me go into uh, my. Well, you, can you do your first one? Yeah, right, since we're here. Cool. <laughs> Jerry Harvey would get rid of all computers if it was up to him. CEO of Harvey Norman says that he could get rid of all computers. He would. I think one of the, this is him like quoting him, I think one of the great tragedies with youth is that they spend so much time playing games and crap on the computers uh, that, and they're not outside. And he goes on and quotes a few more things like, you're not healthy as Big and big. If you're not healthy, it has big problems for the society. And again, he just reiterates: if it was up to him, that he'd get rid of all computers. But then he goes He's on to the, the article goes on to say that um, yeah, he wants to be the the leading online retailer um, of computers. That, of computers, yeah. <laughs> and computers are going to be the you know the, the thing that basically makes them the most money. So yeah, you can't. Have your cake and eat it too. No, well, that's right. But uh, look, there is that. There's probably kids do um, play too too much of computers. Like even tonight in our house, we just made a rule about the tablets. Like you know, both the kids have got a tablet, and both the kids are spending too much time on on them. Like they wake up in the morning, they'll be waking up at like quarter to six, straight on the tablet, and they're pl playing Will's favourite game, Minecraft. Uh, I don't understand it, but uh, they're playing that. And then you know they they play that, and then when you ask them to get ready for school and everything, there's a bit of a hassle, there's a bit of a cry because it's uh, they don't want to stop playing it. So tonight uh, they've been banned in the morning, and they're banned until after after they come home from school, back, clean up, have a shower, and, and probably I'm going to make it have tea. They can do it after tea. So either after tea they can do the tablet, or after tea they can do the uh, TV. But it is a, it is a something you've got to keep an eye on, I think. And you know, yeah, because they should be outside having jumps on a trampoline, or you know, playing cricket, or doing something. Even, even just simple stuff like uh, just having downtime. You know, I think just downtime, there's nothing to do is important. Uh, like I like to have nothing to do. I don't really get too often to do it, but um, but you know, sometimes you just want to. You know, when you just find a nice little quiet spot in the house, or you know, just by yourself, and just turn the lights off and you sit. You can just sit in the dark. And it's just nice and relaxful, nice and peaceful. But uh, but anyway, it's very deep, Glenn. Very deep. It is, isn't it? <laughs> so, but yes, everyone needs downtime, and and kids, I think they are no exception. So, uh, Jerry, you're half right. But banning the whole thing, uh, that's not the answer for me. No, no, I don't think that's right. Yeah, at least, um, at least I know my kids are normal. Mm, yeah, do they have tablets and stuff? Yeah, uh, yeah, they've got the oldest one's got a phone and a tablet. The other one has one of my old iPhones, but the phone part doesn't work. Right. And um, he uses probably my tablet more than I use it. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so, and then they're on the Xbox and all that all the time as well. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> oh, they love it. All right. Now, um, now Telstra, Telstra posts 1.6 billion half-year profit. How's that? How would you like those biggies? Now, that's um, that's a lot. That's a, that's a, that's a lot of moolah. Uh, we they now well David Tooty uh, told a shareholder meeting that they now Tody. have Tody Tooty Tody Tody T H O D Y Tody. All right, are you sure? I worked there for him. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. You're sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have sixteen thousand cloud customers, and that's uh, and we've had over three thousand join us in the last six months. He said they have now sold uh, one point five million four G devices. And they are on track to expand 4G, 4G coverage to 66% of the Australian population by June 2013. Uh, mobile revenue grew by 4.6% to 4.5 billion, with more than 600,000 new domestic customers acqu acquired during the first half. Telstra has now, get this, Telstra now has, how many customers do you reckon they got? How many, like 14, how many um, mobile customers do you reckon they got? Uh, there's what there's 23 million people in the in the yeah I reckon because it's going to have people that have got two phones I reckon they probably got around about the same population probably about 20 odd million oh close-ish but 14.4 uh, million but that's good but yeah but don't remember oh, I should have just read that but well no 
you don't do that, then it's not fair. But <laughs> then it's not a quiz. But um, yeah, but I suppose, you know, you got, tw- so what have we got? 26 million in the country. Uh, so that means, what, say 10, 12 million are with other networks. That's still a, a big share to divvy out. But I suppose that, that that's then split between Optus and, uh, well, Optus got the lion's share, haven't they? Because they control most of the other ones. Um, but anyway, complaints to the telecommunications ombudsman has declined 10%. And there were now 150,000 live customer service chats taking place each month and 2 million visitors to the crowd support site. So that's, um, that's, that, that's uh, probably fairly impressive. Like I've had a go at that uh, live customer help site thing, you know, chat live to a Telstra dude, and yeah. that's not bad. That's good. Uh, I, I have to say that their, their wait time has drastically reduced. I don't know if you've ever needed to ring them up. You know, with um, not lately, no. Oh, you're lucky. You're very lucky. <laughs> but um, but uh, but the times I've rang them up recently, you're pretty much straight. You're pretty much through within ten minutes, which is I remember that like a year ago, two years ago, you'd be there at least half an hour, at yeah. least. At and I'm saying at least. Sometimes you have to go and put the phone back on the charge, you know, because it's just just running out of battery. But, um, but they're obviously doing something right. And uh, Thody said that he wanted to change things up a bit and get customer satisfaction back after, the, after he, he uh, took over from the other little fellow. What was, what was yeah, his the, name um, again? Mexican. What was his name? Uh, something. Yeah, that's, uh, how, that's how quick we forget, isn't it? That's how quick we yeah. forget. Uh, but anyway. I can't think. I can think. I know the Australian bloke, Ziggy Swarovski. Yeah, that was the one before, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, Julio? Julio? Oh, oh, no, it'll I don't come know. to me. He's, he's on the board of Target as well. And, uh, um, oh, I can't remember off the, tip of, off the top of my head. That's crazy. We all, we all, we all bl- bloody uh, thrown verbal abuse at him every week. We should remember. Sol. Sol Trujillo. Sol, yeah, Sol Trujillo. That's, That's him. it. <laughs> That's him. Of course. How could we forget that? Yeah, oh, he's dear. the one that used to bloody have a go at the government all the time. Yeah, yes, but uh, but talking about Telstra and uh, their their stiff competition, the NBN, the NBN Co offers twenty five uh, down and five up megabit megabits on uh, fixed wireless. Now, NBN Co will make a twenty five slash five megabit service available on its fixed wireless network as early as June. Also, be offered on long term satellite services when they re- when they launch in two thousand and fifteen. So, twenty five down, five up. That's pretty good. That's pretty fast. Would that be four G? You reckon, or just the top? Shelf 3G. That is 4G. MBN's fixed wireless network, which uses uses advanced technology commonly referred to as LTE or 4G, is Dream. engineered to deliver services to a fixed number of premises with each within each coverage area. So this means that the bandwidth per household is desi- is designed to be more consistent than the mobile wireless. Now, you might be asking, what is fixed wireless? You know, like then, what is fixed wireless? Well, I'm about. I will tell you. Unlike a mobile wireless service, where speeds can be affected by the number of people moving into and out of the area, the speed available in a fixed wireless network is designed to remain relatively steady. So now, if you go to the mbn.co, uh, mbnco.com.au site, there's you know obviously there's pamphlets and everything, and I've just flashed one up here on the screen. If you what happen to be watching on the video, now wireless like 4G just you know just sort of emanates out, you know, and if you're within the the capture area and whoever else you're with, you're all sharing that same little signal. Uh, but with fixed wireless, you've got your tower and it's sort of like beamed. Uh, you've got a, a certain amount of bandwidth or a channel or have whatever they call it. You know, I don't know the technical things, but it's sort of beamed straight to you. So you've always got um, that, that access. It's not, you know, the, the number of people in that area, they p- can't access the fixed wireless. So something like that. But uh, if you want to know any more, go to the MBN Co and have a look. Or Google fixed wireless services. But MBN Co will be all right. Now, the MBN Co said in a statement uh, today or this week, the wholesale prices for internet service providers who also supply rural broadband users will be pegged at the same rate as they are for fibre users in the cities. So get this, though. $27 per month for the 25 down 5 up service or $24 for the 12 down 1 up service. Hello? Yeah. <laughs> like, hello. But anyway, what was going on? But uh, yeah, so uh, obviously that's going to die out, isn't it? The 12 down, one up. That's what ADSL. So that's going to die out. But uh, yep. but yeah, so uh, yeah, MBN, like, oh, bring it on. Bring it on. It's going to be good. Like, well, I think what they start in our area fairly soon. I think they're going to start next year. 
or late this year and be finished by 2015. So that'll be good. And uh, yeah, I'm a bit like Eric, where I've got like three years to wait, and the estate that's just across from my estate, they've already got it. They've already got it. Yeah. Oh, you'd be blueing. Yeah, I'm not happy. <laughs> oh, you'd be spewing. But um, but, thing, having worked there, I'd yeah, you know, I'd be treated special. But no. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> so, are you in a different electorate? Have we got? <laughs> No, actually, no, we're both in the same electorate. Both. It's a it's a Liberal seat, though. All right. Well, there you go, That's Eric. A, a Liberal seat's finally got some MBN action. Uh, all right. Now, well, what what where where are you off to? What else sort of took your um, interest this week? I'm going to stick with the um, computer theme. I won't go and do a right-hand turn just yet. Uh, bad Kaspersky antivirus update prevents businesses and home users from accessing websites. Basically, a faulty antivirus update uh, sent out by Kapersky, which is um, usually one of the better antivirus people, on Monday left many homes and businesses and customers unable to access any website on their on their computers. It basically, goes on to say that um, how there does, was how does this happen? This is what I'd like to know. Like, don't they test these things? Like, how does this happen? How does this happen in I the know. real world? Bad quality control. I mean, it's not like. It's not like they have to be necessarily... It's probably better for an antivirus company to be last or, or even second or third out with their updates and have them right mm. rather than rush rush out crap. Yeah, well, when you get stories like this, like, it doesn't make you want to go and buy Kaspersky, does it? No. <laughs> but a, a faulty antivirus update. So, yeah, yeah so that they test these things. So left many home and business computers that say what it affected most... XP, I think it was XP, wasn't it? Um, uh, it. I didn't actually take out that part of the story into my notes, but I think from memory it did. It goes on to say, uh, other users confirmed the problem, attempted to troubleshoot themselves. Some reported success, others disabling uh, rep protection component of the antivirus fixed the problem. <laughs> Port 80 and 443 and other web proxy ports were affected. Use later, uh, users later posted responses that they had received from the company's technical support representatives. This included recommendations of temporarily disabling web antivirus components of the affected computers via the management console. And in there somewhere, I've actually got what it was. The issue was caused by a database update released on the 4th of uh, February 2013 at 852 well, how's this? How's, I, I like how this story went on. It goes, the issue was caused by a database update released on the 4th of 2nd, 2013, 8.52 p.m. MSK, Moscow Standard Time. Yeah. Well, well, that must be obviously where that obviously the Kapersky comes from, but I've never read a story, I don't think, that's uh, actually referred to Moscow Standard Time, so there you go. Yeah, that <laughs> it did say uh, manifested itself on the Windows XP systems. However, the fault... Uh, up, the faulty update didn't just affect business antivirus products, but consumer ones as well. But yeah, that, you, you think that they, I don't know, I suppose they can't test everything, and that's the problem, isn't it? There's so many thousands of different configurations out there. I suppose they they, they probably test them on a, a clean skin computer in the lab, and that's probably about it. Yeah, so, well, yeah, like you said, they can't work out every variant and, and what people do with their own machines, but... No, that's I right. Mean, it, it was a big kind of kerfuffle, it was a big outage, you'd think that yeah, you know, they would have noticed something. Well, you, yeah, you'd think so, affecting so many machines. But, I mean, well, if it was just mainly XP, maybe they didn't test it on XP because that's supposed to be pretty much dead and buried, isn't it? They, they've stopped supporting it, um, um, like, with the the consumer versions. Uh, I think they're... Win- uh, yeah, Windows has, Microsoft has, but um, I, think I don't know about anyone else. Hmm. Um, all right, now, talking about Microsoft, Surface Pro, that's come out in the US through the week. It's uh, not available here in Australia as yet. Uh, has not off to a good start, I think. Uh, I don't know. I just I get the feeling that anything that Microsoft puts out always gets a bit of a bagging to start with. Maybe, maybe fairly, maybe unfairly. But um, the US tech writers have given Microsoft Service Pro largely negative reviews. Uh, so there are all these Walt Mossberg and all that. He did say that there was um, the uh, for, uh, uh, he said that uh, he, he, any program he threw at it. It would it worked, so he was happy with that. But he had issues about the battery, which lasted about four to five hours, I think, under his um, the way that he ran things. And the Service Pro runs on an Intel chip, features the full Windows 8 Pro operating system. Uh, whilst it was noted, yeah, so and he, uh, Walt was also worried about the 
the less than usable memory on the 64 gig version. I think we mentioned that a week or so ago. That we did. That, yeah, you get the 64 gig version and you only get about, <laughs> what is it, 20? Oh, I don't know, 20 or so usable, which is pretty crazy. Um, and Mary Jo Foley on Znet said it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not as good of a tablet in terms of weight, battery life as the Surface RT is, but I never th- really thought that was a great thing either, just from just touching it in the shops. Um, but it's also not as good as Windows 8 PC as other OEM product devices uh, coming in at lower price points with better battery life and other specs. Look, um, the, way, the way I look at it, it's uh, version 1. And uh, really, version one are uh, obviously always the worst versions to buy, and the worst they, you know got to iron out the bugs, got to do all that sort of stuff. And yeah, but to put on my error cap for a second, I mean it's Microsoft's first. It's not their first tablet. They've um, okay, it's their first tablet for a while. It's their first tablet using their new operating system, but they've got that. They've had the iPad around for God knows how long. They've had um, Android tablets to. Kind of use as a as a measuring stick, mm, but they're not making them though, so so they've got it. But they've got to they've got to try and make this tablet that that into that talks to the desktops and to the and more than likely to the servers and stuff out there. Like, but I suppose it's Windows Eight which does all the hard work. Yeah, yeah. I, I just think uh, that you know, look, it, it will improve. I think as uh, Mary Jo said, there's probably other uh, out the other makers are producing the same tablet style uh, devices at OEM level that are probably better than the Surface. Uh, you see these ads on the TV every night for the HP one, you know, it's, it's not the Pro, um, but um, if, if they can get it right, if they can get the battery life up a bit, you know, well, who would want one of these things? Seriously, I would. Um, Have you got one? No. No, <laughs> they're a bit expensive. Plus, uh, they're yeah. version ones. Who buys version ones? As as I said, but uh, but you know, well, why wouldn't you want to take it? And another problem they were saying is that the the screen's a sixteen by nine screen. They reckon it's uh, it, it's it, it's not nice. It's not nice to sit on your lap, and it's just a bit too wide for your lap, and all this sort of stuff. But you know, I, I think yeah, I think. People just like to pick on Microsoft a bit. But we'll see how it goes. You know, we'll get them released out over here and just see how it goes. I think if they can make it work, like, I, I would want one. I want one now. I do. I would like one now. I'd want it. I'm going to see if I can get one. All right. <laughs> Have I got to show you a picture of one? There's one there. Same as the I'm sure RT. that you'd be quite happy to do a, a, a review for one on the on the show or something. Mm. But um, yeah, look, I, I, I like Windows 8. I've been using it as on the on my main machine now uh, for what I do day to day things, and I like it. There are still a few issues with it, uh, but that's maybe not with Windows. That might be not the right thing to say. There's issues with other software that won't run on it. We'll say it like that. Uh, and like my ob, as I said last week, and I was getting a bit annoyed, and I'm still annoyed. And because, the week before. Right, I'm still annoyed. I'm still annoyed this week, and I probably will be the next week after this. But, uh, yeah, I've got to boot up into the Windows 7 drive just to run one program, which is a bit of a bit of a problem. But I'm looking at some doing some virtualization, so I just got to um, f- get my head around a few things there. And strangely enough, I've never done virtualization before. Have you ever done that? Yeah, a few times. Yeah, um, I mean, we I, I do it at work, and uh, I haven't. I'm, I'm I was going to do it on this machine. I just haven't had time yet. But yeah, in the past, where when I was studying and I was doing my Microsoft qualifications, I I do virtual machines to stuff around and things like that. Oh yeah. So what did you use to virtualize? Uh, it is, and I think I've still got it. VMware. Oh yeah. Is that free, or you got to buy that? You probably do have to buy it if you want to do the legal thing. Oh, okay. Well, Windows 8 Pro has got virtualization built into it, and that's what I was using. And look, I've got it to work. I've loaded up uh, a virtual Windows 7 inside the Windows 8. But um, I'm just not sure I, what I, well, I could probably ask you. Do If I wanted to, I want to get my virtual computer, I want that to access a physical drive or share a physical drive. Can that be done? So I don't want to, I want, so my Windows 8, so I've got drive... Uh, H, right, which is yep. a hard drive. Yep. Now, I want that accessible in Windows 8, and I want that also accessible at the same time in my virtual Windows 7. Yes, if you configure the virtual IP address and the IP address of your actual host machine to be in the same subnet, then you should be able to share the 
the virtual drive right. on your Windows 8 machine as just a network drive. Right. So, you, but but so that so you can do it as a network drive. So, which brings me to another point then, which I thought, well, okay, well that's fair enough. So, does that mean that that um, to do that, I've got to have two network cards because I've got to have two networks. So each computer. No, no, because what happens is you get the one physical network card, and then virtually that actually your your virtual machine kind of piggybacks off of the same network card so the little ones and zeros will just be going in and out of the same card right because i got to the stage where i can use i can access the internet and the network on the virtual machine or the physical machine i can't do it while they're both running if i if i give some it's like you know the say the virtual machine will take exclusive control of the yeah. of the network card or the physical machine will take exclusive control and they just don't sort of want to share once they get the control but um but i'll work that out but uh, that was hyper v in windows 8 pro i've been looking into that so that looks all right i'll um keep looking into it keep looking into it you and know what you need to do um there's a whole set of i don't know if they still do it but there's a, a it used to be a group of guys in England. Now I think it's only one bloke who does it, and they call themselves or call himself uh, IT idiots. Oh yeah, and they've actually done a whole series, of, and they do one topic each time. They'll do they'll do virtualization. They'll do um, installing an operating system. They'll do things like, and they'll do it all in the latest and greatest. It'll be you know, Windows 8. It'll be Hyper V. It'll be um, installing a server, all that kind of stuff. And they go for, each episode goes for about an hour and a half. They're really kind of in-depth and involved. Oh, so they will, they will show you how to set it up and and so forth? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, let me write that down. Who are they? Idiots. I, yeah, <laughs> IT idiots. <laughs> IT idiots as opposed to yeah. one sitting here. All right. <laughs> now, did you have any, what other story have you got for us this week? Uh, the next one I'll do is the one where president can order preemptive cyber attack if needed. Ooh, so they're already okay. set up and ready to go. Yeah, well, that's actually one of the points that the story makes. Basically, a, a review was done over the last couple of years, and as a result, they've kind of put together a whole bunch of rules that they can that they're now kind of basically put into law. And one of the major things that come out of that is the review, in part, is an ongoing effort by administration to develop the new ground rules for US engagement in cyberspace and the, the key thing is the president has the ability to sort of do a preemptive strike if they can if they feel kind of I don't know, murmurs or rumors coming out of say I don't know North Korea or China or one of those he can sort of say all right hit the button you know get the nerds together and yeah right and and have them attack the the other country obviously in conjunction with or instead of a, a military attack. Get me those anonymous people on the phone now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's take out those Chinese. All right. <laughs> All right, so that's, well, that's interesting. Like there's, I, I reckon that uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that we don't know about, you know, as, yeah. with all this sort of stuff. And, um, yeah, a lot of stuff. All right. One of the, I mean, the, it does go on to sort of highlight there was a, an expert of some sort who made the point of saying look, that... America seems to be more assertive or, or aggressive, for the one of a better word, rather than focusing on defensive strategies. Mm. You know, putting up better defences against cyber attacks. It's now, now let's let's the best defences is kind of offensive kind of thing. Well, I suppose you've got to have a bit of both, haven't you? Like you just don't want to be, yeah. But yeah, you got you got to have an attack. You got to have an attacking uh, arsenal there as well, rather than just defensive. But um, there's a lot of that stuff. But anyway, uh, Google has beat the ACCC in the High Court. Now, this has been going on for six years, apparently. Uh, remember, well, if you want to remember, six years ago, was that 2007? Uh, ACCC said to Google, we've got an issue with your ads. You know, we think you're mixing them all up and, and, um, and blah, blah, blah. So I'll tell you about that in a sec. Uh, so, yeah, victory to Google. After a six-year battle, the ACCC's allegations pertain to Google-sponsored links between 2005 and 2008, which were created by or at the direction of advertisers and displayed on the same page as organic search results. Now, I think this prompted, I think back in the early days there, 2005-ish days, the good old early days, yeah. is, <laughs> I think the, uh, I can't remember, but were the advertised results 
they could have been the, like just on the white screen, but at the top of the the organic results. But th- since then they changed it, so they've got a, like a little yellow background. So they still stand out. Well, today they stand out, and they did back then. You know, I knew everyone knows what what they were because I think they even had the word advertisement up the top, and you knew they were that they that's just how they work. Uh, by publishing or displaying those search results, Google was said to have contravened Section 52 of Australia's Trade Practices Act, which provided that a corporation should not, in trade or commerce, engage in conduct that is misleading or deceptive, or is likely to mislead or deceive. So, uh, the the judgment went on. It was a, a unanimous judgment. Unanimous, Mr. Slocum. Unanimous. So ordinary and reasonable users of the Google search engine would have understood that the representations conveyed by the sponsored links were those of the advertisers and would not have concluded that Google adopted or endorsed the representations, the unanimous high court judgment summary read. There you go. So How many judges make a unanimous ruling? Uh, All of them. (laughs) (laughs) The whole lot. (laughs) I don't know, five? I, I, don't think know. I think there's five or seven, yeah. Yeah, I think there's five. There's not, there's not an even number, I know that. All right. Uh, what, what else have you got? Where else are you going? Where are you taking us, Shane? I'm going to go out of space for this last one. Oh, whoopee-doo. Or uh, well, this next one. Up might the, not be my last. What's my next one? Van Halen belt. Yeah, up around there. Good. All right. No, Armageddon's coming, apparently, on February 15. Oh, no, just before my birthday. Great. And when's your birthday? 20. All right. Great. Won't be here. Dead. <laughs> <laughs> Get in early. Great. That's right. All right. So on February 15th, an asteroid about half the size of a football field, so it's about 50 metres in diameter, will fly past the Earth only 17,200 miles above our planet's surface, which is pretty close in space terms. There's no danger of a collision, we hope. But the space rock designated 2012 DA-14 has NASA's attention. Uh, there's, a, there's like a YouTube video on the actual link that I've provided, but this is a record-setting close approach, says Don Yeomans of NASA's Near Earth Object uh, Program at JPL. Since regular sky surveys began in the 90s, we've never seen an object this big get so close to Earth. 2012 mm. DA-14 will definitely not hit Earth emphasizes Yeomans, uh, but the orbit of the asteroid is known well enough to rule out an impact. All right. The, so. I've got a, like a diagram in my notes, and it basically goes on to say that there's two kind of orbits of satellites. So you've got the low Earth orbit, which is like your um, uh, communication satellites, the space station, the shuttle when it was flying, and then you've got your other ones that are further out, which do weather and all that kind of stuff. This thing apparently is going to pass between the lower ones and the high ones. Yeah, okay. So it is pretty close. Well, 17,000 miles. What is it? It's a, how many miles from Perth to Sydney, do you reckon? Six? Four. Four? So four times that. So it's pretty yeah, close. Probably about here to LA. Yeah, right. So it's, it's pretty close. Um, yeah, because normally these things, I think Jupiter sucks them all in, doesn't it? Because that's so much, such a massive uh, beast out there in the in the universe, in the galaxy. But uh, all the solar system, whatever. Solar system. <laughs> that's right. I'm well, getting smaller. I'll get there soon enough. <laughs> well, it's, that's still that's still in the galaxy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah that's right. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And it's still in the universe, the cosmos, whatever. Now, um, all right, where where am I going to take you? Oh, there's one that I come through, I come across through the week. Now, we all we all know and love Dell computers, don't we? You know, Dell. Yes, we do. Well, he's going the other way. Like this is this is strange. It, it got my interest because I think it's probably a good move. Now, Dell is Dell is a is a public company, but it's going private. Normally, it's the other way around. But this time, uh, Mr. Dell, the the founder, and he's he's pouring his fortune into it. Uh, his shares or whatever, and a bit of his, his own money. He's got equity from private equity firms, Silver Lake Partners and other finance companies, uh, and also a loan from Microsoft, which has got other other people jumping up and down a bit, but, oh, you know, HP and all that, because, you know, they're supposed to be like Microsoft Partners, and if Microsoft gets in the bed with Dell, well, then now that's the big computer-making uh, part of Microsoft. You know, Microsoft will then be moving into that sort of area, which 
makes other people nervous. But anyway, um, yeah, so Dell's going private. Going private will allow Dell to focus more on technology and building enterprise solutions without having to worry about satisfying Wall Street's insatiable thirst for quarterly profits. Good on them. I think this is a good idea. Uh, Michael Dell, well, their share, Dell shares have been falling. And so yep. I guess that uh, he wanted to, you know, keep the, the name going, keep the business going. And this is this is how he saw fit that he could do it. He could he could like bring it back into his control, you know, and, and not report to have to report to Wall Street and, and to the shareholders and and maybe concentrate on long term goals rather than short term profits, you know, because that's what the shareholders are all about. So Michael Dell will continue to lead the company after the leveraged uh, buyout, which includes cash from the Silver Lake MSD Capital and two billion dollar loan from Microsoft, and additional financing from Bofa. Whatever that is, Merrill Lynch. I've heard of her. I don't know what BOFA is. B O F A. Bank yep. of America. That's what it is. <laughs> Bank of America. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, I don't bank there. How would I know? <laughs> How would I know. Uh, Barclays, Credit Suisse, and RBC Capital Markets. Michael Dell will also contribute his own shares to the new company, believed to be about 16% of the total shares, as well as make a sub 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 blah, blah, blah. substantial additional cash investment. As a private company, they will yeah, no longer be focused on quarterly earnings, so good on them. Good on them. Let's see what Dell can do, eh? Um, yeah. Yeah, let's see what they can do. He, he's sick of listening to Wall Street. He wants to just go alone. That's what he wants yeah, to but do. But he was always a... He always had a controlling interest in the company, though, didn't he? Well, not if it was... Well, I suppose, even though it was public, I suppose so, but he would just come under more pressure, I guess. Yeah, I suppose. He, he probably still could be... Well, I'm not sure. It depends on what his, what his share was, doesn't it? Because he could still be booted off the board if his share wasn't um, um, more than 50%. But it must yeah, well, I mean, at the moment, you said he's got, in this new... Kind of way of doing it, he's got 16 percent, yeah. So he's got even more chance of being booted out. Well, not if it's private because he'll own it, he only owns 16 percent of it, yeah. But the other, like, it's uh, the others is a lot of their loans. So, does that this is where we need Eric, but they're, they'd be <laughs> loans, but it's so that they'd be like the, it's, the, the people, the creditors don't run the show, he will run the show, they're just the money, they're just the people he owes money to. Oh, okay. If that makes sense, it makes sense to me. <laughs> so does that mean that when he pays them back the money that their shareholdings drop? Well, they're not shareholdings. They're loans. Well, the Microsoft is a loan. That's what it says here. The Microsoft is a loan. Um, so who's got the other 84% then if he's only got 16 So Michael Dell also contributed his own shares to the new company, believed to be it. So he's probably, yeah, so he's say he's got the company. He's got his stake in it so his capital would be 16 percent say and then the yeah. rest of it would be well by the by the way i read it would be credit as loans would that be right just loans he would own it he would he would have 16 percent of the capital and the other the rest of it would be uh, just loans. so he's actually put 16 percent of his own money so he actually owns probably the whole lot 16 percent of his of whatever it's worth came from his own pocket and mm. the rest of it like you've been saying alone so it's basically like i own my own house but the funds for most of it came from the bank that's right yes but okay. you're not but the bank's not your partner but yeah no. yeah so that yeah that's how i that's how i read it but um yeah well it's a shame eric's not here because he put us straight for sure <laughs> but uh he will explain that in two seconds, but I'm pretty sure that's how it. That's how because a private company, they're limited. Like they can still have shareholdings, but I think they're limited to a certain amount. I think in Australia it could even be like, would it? Oh no, partnerships. I think are limited to twenty people. Is that right? Oh, I don't know. See, Eric, where are you? All right. Yeah, um, listen to this, and then next week we'll revisit this story. Yeah, we might actually. So yeah, listen next week. I'll ask. I'll we'll get Eric to explain the the Dell thing and see if it agrees with what I've just said. But uh, any any of these stories you can find on the AussieTechS.com.au webpage. So go and check it out. Uh, if you miss some, or we sometimes we have more than uh, what we talk about because you know we we go through and get heaps of stories through the week and uh, plop them all in there and just pick out the ones that sort of flow. You know, easy, easy. Cool. Now, um, also, um, don't forget, I, I mentioned the hosting at the top of the show. Don't forget that because that is really great. That is. It's fast. It's affordable. And it's reliable hosting. 99.5% uptime. Look, I've seen some dodgy hosts 
uh, especially I don't want, I'm not going to name names, but I've seen some dodgy ones. You go know. on, rat them out. Go no, on. No, I'm not going to rat them out. I'm just saying that. Uh, look, if your website, you go to it and it doesn't load for for hours, and then some days it loads, and then it's slow, then it loads, then it doesn't. Whatever, you got on, you're on a bad server. You know, you're on a bad one. Come across. Come and talk to me. Uh, AussieTechheads.com.au forward slash hosting. And, yeah, um, but those, those companies, their ads have got nice looking women in. Yeah, but well, that's not the one I was thinking about, but I know the one you're thinking about. And, uh, but that's just all fluff, isn't it? That's just, that's <laughs> it all, could be. That's just all peaches and cream. <laughs> if you've seen the ad. Now, <laughs> Nothing wrong with Pamela? Oh, I didn't say there was. I didn't say there was. <laughs> But um, she doesn't doesn't mean that she's a good host. Well, no, true. <laughs> so, all right. Now, um, Apple iTunes. What have they done this week? They've, I'll tell they've you what. Sold a lot of songs. They have sold a lot of songs. They've sold twenty five billion songs. Can you believe that? It's a B. Yeah, it is a B. It's a it's a big loss. Now the twenty five the twenty five billionth song bought from the online shop was Monkey Drums Remix by Chase Booch, B-U-C-H. And I listened Never to it. Never heard of it. No. Nah. I listened to it, and fair dinkum, I thought it was just lift music. I, it, was, <laughs> <laughs> it was just lift music or, or, or uh, corporate toilet music. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was nothing. But anyway, sorry, uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Mr. <laughs> sorry, Mr. Drums, but, uh, but it was, <laughs> it was rubbish. So... <laughs> Apple said it. It was bought by a German man. Well, there you go. Uh, yeah. Who will be <laughs> will be getting a ten thousand euro or thirteen thousand dollar iTunes gift card? Wow! Uh, oh, lucky bastard. How are you going to spend thirteen thousand dollars on iTunes? So this is this is what you think about. This is where Apple gets their money from. Whether they get thirty percent, thirty cents yeah. in every song that's sold. So 20, 30 cents in twenty five billion songs. I can't. Even, I don't even think I can put twenty five billion in my calculator. Uh, let me have a look. Let me get the calculator going. Calculator. How many zeros are 25 billion? I've got 25 million. Oh, that's not, oh hang on, I've got to turn on its side to get the more zeros. 25. <laughs> i got 25 million. And well, add another three for 25 billion. You used to work in a bank, didn't you? Yeah, we, didn't, life. But we did. But we didn't have billions of dollars. The most I ever counted was a million. Oh, about one oh, point wow. something. Yeah, the Bowls Club or some club after Easter, you know, they hoard it up over the Easter because no one's open and then they bring it in on Monday and they stuff it down on the desk and there's a million bucks there. You can't even put it in the... We couldn't even put it in the safe. Like, we had... The, we, we didn't have, like, one of these walk-in safes. We had what they call book safes where they're just, like, just standalone sort of safes. We couldn't fit it all in. We had to hide it in the branch. <laughs> they made a million dollars over a weekend. Yeah. They, well, well, they got AFL footballers coming to play bowls or something. No, it was an RSL. So it was um, there was no bowls. It was just an RSL club over Easter, over the long Easter weekend. Yeah, it was massive. Oh, so they got AFL footballers come and have drinks and do whatever else they do. Uh, no, um, there's no. You're not gonna you're not gonna pick up on the AFL story. I'm trying to weave in here, are you? No, because there was no AFL where in Ballina. It was um, <laughs> it was uh, it was NRL. So I'm just still I'm trying to work out thirty cents. Hang on, times point th- three <laughs> equals. Now we divide that by a hundred. Why? Because I did thirty cents. I want to find out what dollars it is. Seventy-five million dollars. Ah, uh, that's not right. Why not? Because it's twenty-five billion. Yeah. Eric, and how where much are a you? Song? It's, a, it's a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dollar a song, roughly. So twenty-five. So if I got twenty-five million, add another three zeros, so twenty-five billion. Times thirty cents, right? Times point three, right? Yeah, and that's all you have to do. You don't have to do that hundred stuff because you're oh, yeah, got point point three. Yeah, so it's so it's seven billion, yeah, five hundred million dollars, seven billion dollars, seven and a half billion dollars in in um good profs, good stuff for doing jack. It's all right, isn't it? Now, yeah. what, what's your AFL story? Come on. Oh no! It's the um, it's the thing that's been throughout the whole news: the Essendon Football Club, oh and, and yes, drug scandal, and we probably can't say too much. Why do you know too much? No, because it's just well, yeah. With our vast audience that we've got, I don't want to kind of prejudice, prejudice any kind of court case. court cases or anything. 
<laughs> well, what have they allegedly done? Drugs. What? 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 But not what? Ille- Well, it, it's not illegal at the moment. They're basically saying that substances that they've used. Um, at, at some point, there was some rumours and innuendo when the media were dumping on Essendon. So then Essendon went to the AFL and basically said, "Come and test us." Mm. Yeah. You know, because we've got all these rumours and innuendo and all that kind of stuff and, and we've got really no clue. Come and, and do some testing. And in parallel to that, there was a ACCC investigation, not just on AFL but on sport in general, and they just happened to kind of blow up at the same time. And the ACCC thing came and said that, you know, drugs are rife in sport. You've got um, betting on sport. You've got... Um, yeah, people throwing games, all that kind of stuff. People... Well, it's all blown up over in the UK too, isn't it? The betting scandals. Yeah. Yeah, it's all blown up. Um, yeah, so yeah, well, and then we got Lance Armstrong, you know, he, he's 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 gone, finished. You know, it's, um, it's, it's yeah, no good. And then now it's linked to apparently the, the Suns up here. They've been linked to Essendon. Some of, some of the people that worked at Essendon have been working up here at the Suns and they're going, well, were the Suns involved in it and all this sort of stuff? But uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Look, what sort of drugs are they? All this performance enhancing stuff, you know, should, is, is, is some of it, I would like to know, I don't know, but what, what class of, what's the difference between a performance enhancing drug and a drug that just makes you go better? Like, is, is things like, um, you know, like uh, multivitamins, if that's going to keep you fit and healthy, well, that's going to enhance your performance. They had a, um, on the 730 report, I, caught probably most of it but I missed the first five minutes and and I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination but there's a classification of drugs called peptides I think which are kind of like steroids but they're more the human naturally produced kind of steroids yeah and the the doctor was saying that there's a, a certain range that is healthy for you to have testosterone levels and and oh, I saw that yeah. growth hormones and stuff. Yeah, and he was saying that it should be legal to use what is now an illegal substance to bring someone from below what's normal up to normal. Fair enough. Mm. Don't give it to someone to boost them up again, mm. but at least allow them to go from because if they're crook or whatever, and and they go and play sport like an AFL game or a rugby game or whatever, they're more susceptible to longer-term injuries because they're playing when they're not 100%. Mm. So allow them to use these illegal, in inverted commas, substances to bring them up to standard yep. so they can you know play at their best. Yeah, like, uh, I don't know, it's obviously something that's not going to go away because athletes just want to win. So, yeah, it's not going to go away. But um, I'll tell you what's going to go away if you don't – well, you probably, it's already probably gone away. But uh, DrupalCon was, has been in Sydney looking beyond the content management. Drupal 8 will continue the open source project move beyond purely a content – that doesn't make sense, does it? But anyway, Drupal 8, there's been a Drupal, a Drupal con in Sydney. I think it was a Coogee. Uh, and it's uh, launching or talking about Drupal 8. If you don't know what Drupal 8 is or Drupal, it's a content management system, which means that uh, it's, uh, you can build your website with it. So like our, the Aussie Tech Head site's built with Joomla. Yeah, a lot of a lot of sites are built with WordPress. This is just another one of those ones. Um, you bung it up on your on your host somewhere, and and even with our host, AussieTechHeads.com.au forward slash hosting, you can install Joom, uh, Drupal at, at a touch of a button, one touch of a button, and it'll install for you. And then you just go back out into the back end. You can you know change the text, change your template, whatever. It's a nice easy way of doing your your websites. So anyway, they had a conference in Sydney through the week. The next version of Drupal. Uh, Drupal 8 is due for en- to enter feature freeze on 18th of February, followed by a, by, by a cold freeze on July 1st. So Drupal 8 will be released at the end of the year or whenever it's ready. <laughs> oh, it's good. Uh, so far, more than 4,700 patches have been submitted to Drupal 8 by more than 1,000 contributors. So it's all, you know, that's built by a certain group of volunteers. It's free. Uh, so, yeah, I just mentioned it because it was in Sydney. And if you're looking at building a website, that's just one of the things that you can use. Now, speaking of websites, uh, oh, I had a little, sorry, I had a graphic of Drupal for the ones on video. There we go. Just so you know what I'm talking about. Now, my next story will be, where is it? The global domain dispute of 2012. <laughs> the the uh, dis- dis- disputes are on the squatting. People are sick of squatters. Well, they've always been sick of squatters. The 
some of the big brands that filed cases with the World Intellectual Property Organization in 2012 included Apple, Dyson, Ikea, IBM, Intel, Lego, McDonald's, something, Fizzer or something, and Royal Bank of Scotland. Now, dot com was the... Pfizer. That's a um, pharmaceutical company. All right. Well, they've got the money. They can dispute all they want. Dot com was the domain name most recovered from the cyber squatters who register and typically profit from a domain owned by someone else. So a cyber squatter is, say, I don't know, say, um, so I registered ShaneJohnson.com. And then Shane comes along and says, well, that's me. I own that name. And so they, he takes me to the World Intellectual Property Organization and they go, well, Glenn Goodman, you uh, do not own Shane Johnston, so give it back to him. <laughs> Pretty much something Pretty like much. that. Something like that. Something like that. Isn't it also because you had like you, you've got people that go to the point of keeping track of when domains um, expire and mm. jumping on an expired. I can't remember the name of the company, but a few years ago there was a big hoo ha because a company probably the size of Coke, I think it was, mm. um, let theirs expire. Jeez. Some bloke jumped on it. You're kidding. And um, yeah, it was it was the fact that say it was Coke because Coke itself is a registered trademark. It was a you know mm-hmm. shut and dry case. Yeah. I think they actually end up giving this bloke X amount of dollars just to make him go away, kind of thing. Yeah, right. Well, it, it, it's once you know, like it's astounding because like to register a domain name is like uh, it's a dot com is probably it's around about thirteen bucks something like that a year, which is yeah. nothing. It's nothing. And so why Coke did not. <laughs> well, well, just saying it was. We're not even sure it was, but but that's a that's a real strange one, and um, you know, and that's why the .dot com .dot au are a bit more tighter. They're uh, you can't just you can't just log in and just claim one like you can with a .dot com. Like you could just log into, um, say, log into the Aussie Tech Ed's hosting uh, server, and you can just type in a .dot com if it's available. You just buy it straight away, no no questions asked. But if it's a .dot com .dot au. Uh, we're required to get an ABN from you, and then that then cross checks with the ABN register, make sure it's uh, current and correct, and you've got to say what state you're in. And there's a lot more other stuff to go on because they're just trying to stop the squatting, you know. And, uh, and it's probably an issue. Like there's other issues, like uh, say Coke.com, uh, and then I go and register Coke.net, you know. So, yeah, so and all the other suffix ones. Yeah. Yeah, and there was a there was a, a a high profile one I'm not sure who it was uh, but they had say we'll use Coke as an example again but Coke.com and then someone went and went okay well Coke.net and, and used that Coke.net as a porn site you know and, yeah. and so that, and that was putting a lot of bad bad press towards Coke's brand you know because not that anyone would believe that that was owned by them but still it was it was close enough you know and so anyway I think the guy had to surrender it and Coke probably bought it for Thirteen dollars. Oh, Actually, there was an, another one. Um, White House. I think WhiteHouse dot com or dot gov takes you to where it's supposed to. Mm. And WhiteHouse dot com or dot net was a porn site for a while, and and might still be for all I know. That might, well, that might have been the one mm. I'm thinking about. Yeah. Ha- have a quick look. <laughs> I'm not going to bloody infect my machine. Oh, I was not going to infect. I'll have a look. Um, what what did you say? White House. White. White House, either dot .com or dot .net or something like that. Dot .com. Let's have a look and see what's that. White House. No, nah, it's just some landing page. Married women want you, Russian wives. Find it at local pages. There. Whitehouse.net. Let's have a look at they might have fixed it up. No, oh, that America have got a, a chief technology officer. Hmm. Might have been his first job. <laughs> well, White, Whitehouse.net looks like a fair income page, but it's pretty light on. It's probably it's probably not real because it's got on the front a picture of the White House and a, a little banner going "Your ad here." <laughs> look, look, look in the menu; it's got a "Who done it?" The authors of this site are such and such. Oh, yes, it's a joke, a parody. Although it started as a protest, so there you go. Whitehouse.net. dot <laughs> net. All right. Anyway, uh, now did you have any more stories, Shane? Because I think I've got one more before we go. No, I, um. I didn't submit that many this week because I didn't realise it would just be us two. That's all right. Just, just don't know. Now, I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you <laughs> my last story. Now, how's this? Now, think talking about numbers as we were with uh, 75, 25 billion, you know, how many zeros was it? How's this dude, uh, mathematician, finding 17 million digit prime number? 
And he said it was like climbing Mount Everest. Can you believe that? Can you believe it? I said, when I first started reading this story, I thought, well, you know, numbers just go on and on and on and on and on. So what's so big about finding a real big one? You just add one, you've got enough number. So, <laughs> you know, so what's the big deal? But uh, apparently, I suppose, you know, they've got to be known and, and, and logged or whatever. But this 17 million million digit prime number so i think what then then started making it interesting for me what started getting me in is then when you think about what a prime number is so a prime What's a prime number glenn i'll tell you what a prime number is uh for those of you who don't know the prime number is a prime number is a whole number that can be divided only by one and itself and itself that's yeah, right i remember now so seven can be divided by one and itself seven so things like that. So anyway, so obviously, as you get higher and higher, the, 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 you know, there, there's um, the prime numbers. How, how can you divide it by by itself and one, and make sure that it can't be divisible by any other number? That that's the problem. That's the that's the the secret to this, to the, to the aura of this perplexing Couldn't, story. Can't you just write a program to actually work this out for you? I mean, this guy made it like he sounded Everest. All you'd have to do is just write a little friggin' JavaScript thing, turn it on, and then, you know, see what happens a couple of days later. But there's a lot of numbers. There's a lot of numbers. So, anyway, so uh, anyway, the prime number, which is more than 17 million digits long, right? So that's that's how long the, the number is, 17 million digits long. Ah, oh, so it's not just 17 million. No, 17 something. million oh, okay. digits. Yeah. So it won't make computers run faster or help scientists develop better rockets. However, searching for the number was an exhilarating journey for Curtis Cooper, big old CC, a mathematician at the University of Central Missouri. Now, if this prime number, 257,885,161 no, was typed out in a standard times Roman 12 point font it would span more than 30 miles it would fill more than 6 Bibles a pri- um, uh, and now there's another thing that's rarer than a prime number or more rare I should say yeah. is, uh, is uh, a mazine so I can't pronounce I can't pronounce words very well but I, I have a bit of grammatical experience now m- m- mezzanine and that's another one I can't pronounce so mezzanine prime numbers are extremely rare with this discovery, only 48 are known. Each me- me- mezzanine, mezzanine, oh, whatever it is, <laughs> M-E-R-S-E-N-N-E, mezzanine, mezzanine, whatever. Uh, each mezzanine uh, prime is, an incre- is increasingly difficult to find. Now, mezzanine primes, hang on, can we get, can we get a pronunciation on mezzanine? Uh. Hang on, hang on. I've got to get a pronunciation Call in the pronunciator. Where, where's the pronunciator? Now, uh, how do you spell it? M E R. Oh, look, hang on. M E R. Is there a website that actually tells you how to pronounce words? Yeah, the dictionary. All right. So here we go. Here we go. Ready? Yeah. Mersan. A oh, Mersan. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, pronunciator. <laughs> Mersenne primes are two raised to the x power minus one. For instance, the number three. For instance, the number three is a Mersenne prime number because it can be written as a two squared minus one. Number seven is also a Mersenne prime number because it's two cubed <laughs> minus one. To find this new Mersenne prime. Cooper used 1,000 computers on his university campus in Wa- Wa- Warrensburg, Mo. Warrensburg, Mo. That must be a state. Each each computer yeah. checked individual numbers. Montana. Oh, okay. Can we get a pronunciation on that? No. Okay. Each computer <laughs> checked individual numbers. Dual core machines could check two numbers at once. The computer that discovered this 17 million digit prime is a Dell. Oh, good on you, Dell. Desktop running on Intel dual core processor. There you go. Good on you. So you got primes, Mersan, and them. All right. <laughs> oh, that concludes our maths lesson. That's right. <laughs> but oh, look, maths is quite interesting. I don't mind maths. Uh, and when you think that you know, there's um, yeah, Mersan primes two raised to the x power minus one. There's only what forty eight are known. Whew, it's crazy, crazy stuff. Crazy. There's a job for you, Glenn. Find find some more. Yes, okay. <laughs> oh, well, oh, I've got a few dual-core processors hanging around here somewhere, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it. 
All right, maybe next Let's, week. You'll have to unpack one. Well, I might have to. I might. Have, well, yeah, it's in the in the thing over there. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the show. Did you have anything else, Shane? Or you you you're out. No. Um. Yeah, I'm done. You're Don't busted. You are bumped. You're out. All right. So uh, thanks for coming on, and uh, we hope yeah. to see you next week. And, yeah, you uh, should do. Hopefully, hopefully so. And so thanks for the guys sitting in the lounge who stuck with us tonight through the once again some uh, some uh, issues with the stream and so forth. I'm not sure why these things keep happening to us, but they do. But that's just, you know, you're using software that is experimental. That's that's why. Oh, that's my phone. Oh, I, I don't mind that song. Now, uh, so until next week, I, we wish you a, a very good night and we'll see you all and hopefully with a full panel. So good night, farewell, see you next week. Bye-bye. See ya.